Okay, hello, I'm due to finish in about 30 seconds time, so it's going to be really quick. <laughs> um, yes, 1722 Wagonway project. There was a Wagonway, I don't need to tell you the whole story of it. 1722 it was constructed, it's the earliest known railway in Scotland. Um, it didn't go at this jaunty angle, it was much shallower than that, but nonetheless, and some years later, the unfortunate James Patterson, who we built our wagon in memory of, was killed on that wagonway, the first death on a railway in Britain or anywhere in the world, as far as we can make out. We built this wagonway just as a bit of fun, this wagon as a bit of fun, really, but it's led to all kinds of nonsense since then. Um, we've opened a little museum shed um, in Kakenzie um, with a fantastic range of stuff, and that's recently taken some digressions into having found... Uh, a diary of a joiner builder who was around in Kakenzie during the 1722 and up to the 1745. Um, so we've got a little area there um, to show how he might have worked. Right, so Kakenzie, if you don't know, um, right, Kakenzie's in there somewhere, just in there. Um, so uh, we're there, that's a bit of a false map. It shows some of the sites that were in operation 17th, 18th century. You will see there were loads of industrial salt pans around the Firth of Forth. Um, Kakenzie, Port Seaton, it's actually one place, Kakenzie and Port Seaton are now joined together, but they were very distinct, and I don't need to tell you the whole history of them. Um, Port Seaton is here, this was Port Seaton Harbour. By the time of 1852, the survey had been wiped out, and uh, focus had moved down to Kakenzie, see it down here. Um, the building I'm going to talk about in a little bit is actually just in here that there. There's a church and there's some ruins marked on here. Um, there, however, are lots of other remains around here. We've excavated pans here and there's also a glassworks here, which we can talk about another day maybe. Um, I got interested in this. I moved to Kakenzie, I don't know, it was 1990 something or other, um, and I got involved with a project in Bones, Dimmick's Buildings, 1640s, um, really nice merchant's house, courtyard, lots of things going on. As part of the development, um, we had to do some excavation and uh, Gordon Ewart Kirkdale led that excavation and underneath the 1640 building we found this fantastic structure. You see it there, see the curving wall? And then it goes out through the wall of the 1640 building and out into the lane Scotland's close behind. It's all underlying it and excavating down through this, you see there's a metre of uh, muck basically. That's not muck, it's all waste from the salt industry. This was a big industry. Um, Pont's map um, or sketch of Bones shows this really clearly as a series of salt pans along the bay and this is this is where it was all happening this is the Hamilton salt pans um, however um, that piqued my interest a little bit so I think well wait a minute Kakenzie Port Seaton what have we got uh, there so I, I noticed that along the shore there was a sort of curving structure at the back of the old kirk mm, that's awful similar to what we found in Bones uh, never had the means to actually look at what it was doing at the time anyway, and then I started doing my own research. So where do you go? You want to research salt industry. Um, where do you look? Of course, you start looking at this. It's everybody's mentioned. It's almost like a Bible of 18th century salt making. There's, there's things in it I, just, I wasn't sure about. I didn't quite understand. I think lots of people are uncertain. But I think, I think it's probably quite an accurate description of what was going on. But there are illustrations. This is only one um, in Brownrigg's book. They, they show a process, but they show it kind of slightly stripped down. They've taken things out. He's simplified it. Um, there are figures which don't quite make sense. Um, the broad principle is all there, though. There's a fire at one end. Uh, uh, oh, where's the thing going? There it is. Fire there, flue there, chimney there. Somebody standing there, and there's a salt in its lovely little basket there. And there's a pan on top, of course. The principles are all fine. But it got even more complicated. The more we dug as a wagonway group, the more we found. And we started to find things like this. So these are, this is a reference um, locally. This is specifically at Mr. Carroll's works um, at Kakenzie. So there's another similar stripped down description. There's a pan, there's a chimney, there's all sort of stuff going on, gubbins going on here. Description of one of his pans. Also fantastic, a little picture of the wand, the bucket and the wand for raising the water um, or the seawater up. So, so this started making us think, okay, we, we've got um, enough information here to start looking in earnest at this locally. We also found, just on a trip down the shore one line, I don't know how this had missed us previously, but uh, Preston Pans, another big centre just along the road from Kakenzie, salt panning. There's one building sits out on the shore, and this has to be the best preserved of these kind of salt pans anywhere. Um, it's been converted into a house on the upper floor. In fact, apparently, it's an Airbnb 
well, I've never managed to find out how you rent it, um, and the basement is still in there with its locked door that you can't get into, um, <laughs> and we can't find the owner. Um, but you'll see this, this is actually a, a salt works, and you can just about see in there, there's a door, which we've been calling ash doors, but there were maybe ventilation doors, there were maybe flu draw doors, um, and certainly for getting into the chamber behind. Really, really good example. So we've now got quite a lot of information, and we decided to build a salt pan. So we couldn't build something that size, so we built something really totally tiny, um, which is actually not far off the scale of the building of the um, salt pans that were in use prior to the 17th century, and in some places, like Barora, even later. We, we started to experiment. We wanted to find out what was going on and actually work out how the process worked. It seems simple, but it actually isn't as simple as it appears. Um, we found a bucket pot. So you were talking about size of bucket pots here. Here's one um, that we put a little dam into. We were absolutely clear that's what it was. And I'll show you in a second why. Um, there we are. There it is with the little dam in place, filled up with water. And you can just about see, there's one of the post holes. There's another one over here. There's a series of them there very clear evidence of the timber platform structure that led back into the pan house behind. Um, a lovely example. We didn't clear out all the rocks, incidentally. We started and then thought, this is going to be a big effort. You can see why, when their pans were running, if there was a storm, they would lose production for quite a long time. If this came into your bucket pot, you, you had to shift that rock. And it's no mean feat shifting all of that out. Um, and incidentally, I just put this in because I took the photograph and I thought I'd use it. Um, some lovely wildlife going on inside the, inside the bucket pot, um, including mussels there. So you can see they were obviously collecting mussels here as well. Um, it's nice to see all this, though, because uh, Kakenzi, as you may know, has a reputation for being a little bit dirty with the nuclear, uh, not nuclear, the coal power station sitting directly next door to it. It's cleaned up its act a lot. Um, and the fourth is a lot cleaner than it was. So there's the pan. Um, Jackie's already talked about it a bit. Um, this is the original incarnation of our pan, and it has these little scratch pans in the corner. So one of the objects of this exercise was to try and work out just what was going on in the process that Brown Rigg describes. So we put the scratch pans in as he described, and as he described, they work. Uh, and there's various other elements of the process that tie in very, very well with what he was describing. Similarly, uh, Calmeter, he describes the same kind of process it all seems to work. So attention turned back to the old Kirk. If I can remember which button to press, there we are. And these are some of the locals. And uh, I found this postcard and it showed the old Kirk salt pan, or what I was calling the old Kirk salt pan, as a house. And rather frustratingly, people's washing hanging in front of it, blocking any evidence that it might have been a salt pan. Anyway, it kept digging, and we found some more pictures. Uh, Kakenzi was actually quite a popular destination for artists in the 19th century. There were quite a lot of photographs and paintings made of, of this area, in particular, the boat shore. Another photograph. There we are there. There he is. Um, old Kirk salt pan. Oh, there's, there's the old Kirk, incidentally. Um, again, it's a house. Um, and another one. Uh, it's a house in that one as well. Just about to give up. Um, thinking, okay, it maybe is a house. When this photograph turned up, this is, as you can see, fairly early. I'll not tell you the whole story, but the Caddles, one of them fancied himself as a bit of a photographer. Um, I'm not saying he wasn't very good, but there are some pretty terrible photographs amongst the surviving collection. However, there's one here. There's the old Kirk salt pan in there with its door uh, missing its top. And there's the old Kirk there. Relationship is absolutely perfect. This really got me thinking that th this is worth investigating further. Um, there's the location here. This is called the Boat Shore, which is a little natural harbour. Um, okay. We thought we'd better have a serious look at this then. And we started trying to put together community archaeology projects. So we started off at Kenzie Harbour because we're called the Wagonway Group. And we're looking predominantly at the Wagonway, which went at some point to Kenzie Harbour. It also, however, serves these salt pans. So initially, the development would have been uh, coal workings along the shoreline. They were exhausted quite early on, looked further afield for coal, and we know that the wagonway was constructed in the early 18th century to maximise use for these pans. 
Um, we think this building now was put in about 1640-ish by the Earls of Winton. And I'll show you why, we've think, why we think that now. This is the first year of excavations. It was all very exciting for me. I was really, really keen to get into this building and we found hardly anything apart from lots and lots of 19th century debris from the collapsed house that had been on the site previously until we got to the very bottom of one of the walls and we found this little section of fragments of uh, a plate um, which we've had dated fairly accurately to the early sec half of the 17th century. It gave us dating evidence, but it didn't give us an awful lot else. We'd, we'd just taken a corner out of the building, really. We then came back the next year, and we did a slightly... Oh, we did a wee reconstruction of it as well. We got a... Well, we didn't do it ourselves. We got somebody who knew how to do <coughs> these things um, to make a, a reproduction of the, of the plate, which you can buy, incidentally. Um, next year, we went back and we excavated a larger area. Um, season one was really just this corner. Season two, we went a little bit further. We took out the other half as well. We're going down through the 19th century domestic debris there. Um, season two g really gave us a good indication of what was going on. But frustratingly, it didn't quite get down to the levels that we wanted to. And it hadn't gone far enough back to show the workings of this, this building. So what I'm going to look at now is just the most recent excavations, which were just this year, hot off the press. Um, where are we now? We're in October at the moment, so it was a month ago, something like that, just over a month ago. Um, we did another excavation and we pulled that excavation back by a couple of metres, involved removing a lot of spoil, and we got really into the guts of this building. And this is what interested me more than a lot of the other things, is trying to work out how did this work? How did salt pans work? There's all these descriptions, speculation, uh, this is an opportunity to actually look at the whole guts of the thing in situ. So, um, I, I should maybe just add incidentally here, while we're looking at these kind of things, just if anybody's remotely interested, um, at the same time as we were doing that excavation, we were doing another community excavation up the road on the wagon way, um, and it stole all the publicity <laughs> because, <laughs> because um, there's the fantastic remains of the 1722 wagon way, um, and also subsequent rebuilds of it. So there's a lot of information there. If you want to see any of that, go to the Wagonway Group's Facebook page. There's some really good information on that. Um, so that excavation was in tandem with the final excavation at the Old Kirk. You can start to see we've got wooden sleepers in situ, the scars of them, and we also had very clear evidence for the gauge and the line of that line. Okay, this is Alan, Alan Bravey's fantastic plan um, from the excavations this year. I'm going to rattle through it, actually. Um, there's the building. Some kind of major catastrophe, presumably involving a northeasterly storm, has taken out this corner. Um, it's been rebuilt. Buttressing in here. Another buttressing in here. Something going on here. Pits, ash pits, bits of ironwork in situ, and a chimney here. But there's a door in front of the chimney. So, here we go. This is the... Uh, plan that we have taken by Neil, who was fortunately a former uh, mine surveyor. He's done a fantastic job of recording, and this is my terrible job in trying to zoom in and out um, on the computer, but you see that's a proper 3D mesh model of the excavations as we did it this year. Things to look out for in this. These are ash pits, very clearly, and they extend back beyond this wall which we've put in. Um, here, just zooming in here, there's an archway, can you see it? A full height archway and a door into the side of the building. These are the buttresses. This is very, very clearly an inserted chimney into a doorway or an ash door on the front of the building. The C's on the other side. Rattling through again, comparison, other buildings of this type. Talked about some of these already. I don't need to go into them in detail. Um, Aaron here, the cock of Aaron salt pan. There it is there. This is the old kirk. That's as far as we got in our excavation, but it's got the mechanisms, the workings of the important parts, and I'll show you why in a second. Um, more or less, the back wall between the forehouse and panhouse would have been somewhere in this position. Um, there's a C up there. That was all nice and blue in my illustration, but it's not come out. Never mind. Okay. 
So I started making a wee mesh model, and this is why I've had no time to prepare the talk. I spent so long making a mesh model, I ran out of time. So here we have it, archway on the side. You can get into the chamber. This is the main pan chamber as it is. There's the door for firing it, and I suspect, given that there's no other position for a chimney, that the chimney is exactly as Kalmeter and Brownrigg describe above the firing door. Um, and as you have seen in the earlier ones, that's where they are as well, at uh, Aran, etc. Um, what have we got here? We've got the lower pan house walls. We then move around it. You'll see there's looking from the fore house, how it all works there. If I click on again, we should have buttresses. There are buttresses in the corners, maybe introduced to stop the sea washing the whole thing away. More likely inserted to, of course, support the pan, as Brownrigg describes, at its four corners. Um, so we've got buttresses. We've also got uh, furnace walls. There's a square enclosure within that which you can walk into from the sides, and that's where the furnace wall. This was a sole pan, so the fire was burning on the deck, straight up and catching the bottom of the pan. The pan itself must have been supported some other way. And I suspect that the uh, truth of the matter is that the pan um, was supported, as it's shown earlier, on, on rods, on lugs. So there'd be lugs on the bottom of the pan. There's nothing in here that suggests that it was supported from underneath, again, as Brownrigg describes. A wee digression. Um, what I looked at as well when I was doing this was what's all that brickwork doing on the inside? This is the guts of the salt pan. Uh, not that long to run through this. Chimney there. This is the brick structure, two furnaces, ash pits below, and that's the back wall. So if I go again, I should be able to spin around this and just show you. There's two furnaces, two ash doors, and there's the grate in there. And we found one of those beams that's in situ. This is a pretty common 18th century arrangement, and you can find it on, for example, James Watt, steam engine for uh, one lock head, improved boiler system, flue, there's the arrangement there. There's the, there's the ash underneath. There's the flue there, and there's the, the grate above it. And then somebody posted this on Facebook last week, the most fantastic photograph, which it says is interesting, and it is. Um, this is the guts. This is what has been inserted into our 17th century salt pan. You can see exactly how it works, and interestingly, nobody believed. You can't have furnaces that long, but you can. Look, there's, there's the fire irons sitting at the side. Massive long things to be able to get to the back. You don't need to get to the sides or the front under this arrangement, you only need to get to this bit where you're firing. And interesting, you can't keep the access to the chimney because you've got an arrangement where the fire is much closer uh, and there's no space above it to put a chimney. That's why the earlier ones or the sole pans are usually described as having an entrance to the fireplace, to the chimney above uh, the, the fireplace. There we go, and move swiftly on. Top wall, of course, because the whole thing was a two-story structure, it was all enclosed, getting into speculation now. It's pretty much speculation anyway. But, um, so we've got a two-story structure, quite large. When you actually realise how big these things are, they're enormous. There's where the four house is. I'm not sure that four houses were built onto all of these buildings originally. A lot of the ones I've looked at, they seem to be butting up against the side. But there's the doorway into the, into the pan house. And then chimney, muckle chimney. I've shown it in the middle here, because I think that's where it was originally, and it's been moved. Um, and then... We've got, uh, hopefully, we've got the forehouse coming in as well, which is there. You see that encloses the whole thing. Nice shelter um, for the workers. And uh, we'll spin back round again, and I'll put a roof on it, and you should have some indication as to what I think the old Kirk salt pan looked like and how it worked. So there we go. There it is, without its roof. Of course, it had a roof. There's a roof going on it. And then that's me done. Thank you. <laughs>